Hi everybody, welcome to Photographer's Coffee Morning. Today we have two incredible photographers with us, Nathan and Zoe of Nathan and Zoe Photography. They are fine art wedding photographers extraordinaire. They're a husband and wife team and they work high-end weddings in the United States. Without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to those guys and let them say hi. Like Nathan and Zoe, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got started? We're Nathan and Zoe. Zoe started photography as a hobby at some point in the line while we were dating a couple years after we started and we started doing it as a hobby together and after our son was born we just decided we wanted something where we could spend more time together rather than going to two separate jobs and having to leave our son somewhere else we were like let's give this a go and and see if we can make it work and so far we have i think we've always had some like dependency issues that we should resolve in therapy but we like to be together a lot. And so when Nathan was in school, he was going to college to be an aerospace engineer. And he is three years in. We realized, wait a second, if he finishes this, he's going to have to work minimum eight to five. And then most likely we won't want to live in a busy place. So he's going to have to commute. So he's going to be home in the afternoons and I'm a go to sleep early person. So we're going to have no time together. And this isn't what we want for our life. It never was the plan, but in our minds, he was going to go to college and then we're going to have all this free time. And with Beckham being born, we are just like, no, this isn't what we want. Let's figure it out. You started the photography business around your lifestyle more than anything else by the sounds of it. You thought, no, we need to find a way of being together more than we are. Like, how do we make that happen? And that's, that's a hell of a thing to walk away for a career in aerospace. I think that's obviously not something you can just stumble into. You don't just kind of wake up one day and think, you know what? I really want to be an aerospace engineer. So what was that experience like? Obviously, I know that there was an incentive. You wanted to be together as a family. But how did it feel to step away from that career, Nathan? Um. Well, I hated it. So it wasn't like super hard. Like Zoe said, I was three years in. I had one year left to finish up my engineering degree, but I'd hated it for a year at least at that point and didn't really want to do it anyways, but felt like I had to finish it for a while there. So I was just trudging along trying to get it done, but I think I knew it wasn't where I wanted to be anyways. And so the photography after Beckham was born provided that way out not that it was easy because I went to school for aerospace engineering and there's a lot of like society pressure and a lot of ego boost that you get from being in a stem field versus going into something in the arts and so it definitely for that reason was a difficult transition because it was a lot of like oh you're really quitting university to attempt to make this like creative thing work where we're from a small town in Texas where people don't become wedding photographers. So the thought of doing that to most people seemed crazy. I think to us it also seemed crazy, Um, but it was what we wanted and we really thought we could do it, which is crazy to think about because we had nothing going for us at that moment. Yeah, I don't really know why we thought we could do it other than thought that we could was it literally just the case you woke up one day and thought no this is i don't want this anymore like how did you how did you go about making that transition was it literally cold turkey right i'm leaving school i'm leaving university i'm going to go straight to like photography style we have a habit of making complex messy difficult processes that people really wrestle with overly simple because we don't want to dwell on it but making that transition might genuinely be something that somebody listening is considering so what did it look like? Like, How did you get from enrolled, still doing your course, to being active as a photographer? What were those intermediate steps like? So it definitely wasn't quick and easy at all. I wrestled with it like a ton, especially because it was like, at this point, we kind of do the photography, but do I still try to finish up my degree just so I have it? Like I'm only a year away. Do I do it just for the sake of having it if I need it later? But I'm not really a person who's good at splitting focus when I find something that I like want to do. Like, that's all I want to do. Once we had decided that, and once our son was born anyways, I hated going to school. I hated leaving them at home to drive up there. And so 
the last semester I was really like, slipping anyways because I just wouldn't go most of the time. My attendance was super poor. I had started having severe panic attacks. Severe panic attacks. It had gotten to the point where even if he wanted to go sometimes, I physically couldn't be left alone with our baby because I couldn't take care of myself, so I couldn't also take care of him. And so I think there were several things that were adding up and it's hard to, I think when you love something, you can be like, yeah, it, it's getting rough, but I'm going to keep doing it. But when you're doing something because you you felt it was the right thing by just like society or just the idea you had growing up, it's harder to stay in it when you don't love it. Yeah, for sure. It was, it had gotten harder and harder. But even then, that was 2019. Beckham was born about May of that year. I finished up that semester. I scraped by barely passing most of my classes. And after Beckham was born and everything, going into that summer was when we decided, hey, we want to do wedding photography. We'd photographed one wedding for a friend. It was kind of okay. Family, friend, we didn't really know him, but like distant family, friend, person. And we were like, hey, I kind of think we can make this work. So June, July of that year, we were like, well, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to post up some Facebook ads saying we offer wedding photography, run them mugs, and just see what happens. We book six weddings in two weeks. And at the time, um, we were like, oh my God. We charged a thousand dollars total, but we charged them up up front. We didn't require like a deposit. We just made everyone pay in full. On a two week span, we made a little over six thousand dollars. And at the time, we'd never made six thousand dollars in a month before. We only made combined thirty thousand dollars a year at that point. And so it was more money than we'd ever made all at one time. That summer, we were like, okay, I guess we're doing this. And we had decided we wanted to move back closer to our parents. So we moved back to our hometown where we live now. But even then, that that fall came around. And I was like, well, I'm so close to graduating. I'm not going to do the engineering anymore. But I talked to an advisor at the college. And I enrolled in some online courses to just finish up a degree. I was going to get a degree and get a teaching certificate. So I had a degree to fall back on. But at that point, we were so in love with the wedding photography so quickly that I think I went to class on those online courses for the first week and I never went back. And I've never been back to college since. I literally just flunked every single one of those classes and never showed up. There's a lot to relate to and a lot to unpack. So I'm going to try and break this down into like bite-sized chunks for people. So... Zoe, the first thing is you mentioned having panic attacks. And if it helps, I can relate to that. Like I, I have an anxiety disorder. It's something I'm going to have to deal with. And I think a lot of people are in the same boat. There are a lot of people that find these things and they don't always trigger at the best of times. For me, like I got my first diagnosis just before getting married. It was within three or four weeks. And I think I'd never felt secure enough that I could address a lot of this stuff. And all of a sudden you're in a safe environment with somebody that you know cares about you. And all of a sudden, all this stuff that you've been hanging on to just pours out. And like you were saying, that there's an element of needing the support from somebody else. But from your point of view, Nathan, I just wanted to say that for every every single person out there that's felt like they've got an anxiety issue, the choices that you made to shelve something that you'd invested a lot of time and energy into, that you minimized it now, but that can't have been a small decision in the moment. And I just wanted to thank you, essentially, because you made a decision for your family over your own personal self-interest and you prioritize the health and mental well-being of somebody that was incredibly important to you and those are not trivial matters and they have been life-changing for the two of you and frankly Zoe I'm kind of glad you had the panic attacks now in a sense because you wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for that and I think for anybody that's following along you should definitely check out Nathan and Zoe's website and their Instagram links in the show notes because the work's beautiful and I think it's interesting that you chose weddings because essentially the reason you left your chosen vocation prior to this was because you felt that the importance of your marriage was of more excelling value. It was something more worthwhile than 
what you had, which is the potential of a secular career that would have been successful in a traditional sense. That's the first element. So I just wanted to cover that. But the second thing I wanted to talk about was the fact that you just jumped in. I have a little bit of a theory that people that have to make something work will, (laughs) in a lot of senses, because I think anybody hearing that you went from zero to having six weddings books, you're going to get one or two responses. You're going to be like, how did that happen so quickly for you? It took me 10 years. Or you're going to hear people saying like, same, that's exactly what we did. Like We we jumped in at the deep end and we made it work. Because you've essentially had to do a cold start, you've had to start from zero and jump straight into doing this. You'd made those bookings, you have those six weddings that are ready to come in, you took your payment up front. Like, how did it feel being thrown in at the deep end and having to make it work and earning more money than you've ever earned, but you've committed yourself to six weddings in that month? Like, how did you deal with those early weddings? How did you get through that beginning stage of photography? What did that look like for the two of you? The six weddings we booked were pretty spread out, so it wasn't ever like they were piled on top of each other. So those were booked like early June of 2019. The very first one wasn't until the end of August of 2019. And then the last one wasn't until July of 2020, which is a whole nother story. Got into the thick of all of it. Well, I think the one thing that we had to our advantage was that our website showed our work. And there was one wedding on it. There was like one picture of one wedding because it was a wedding I second shot with another photographer and I didn't have a whole lot of pictures from it. And so like we booked those weddings off of family work, random pictures we'd taken of friends. Like we didn't, I mean, we fudged like words that we used a little bit to make it seem a little bit better, but we didn't really lie about where we were at. I mean, I can remember sitting in the consult for our first wedding ever, and the person was like, hey, where our wedding's going to be at? It's going to be really dark. They didn't use these exact words, but pretty much like, how proficient are you with using like flash and stuff work? And Zoe, Zoe looks at this lady and goes, we have flash. That was her response. She didn't say we know how to use it. She said we have it, which also wasn't even true. We didn't even own flash. So... It was like she was trying to make it more truthful, but she still told a lie. Maybe she said, we'll have Flash, because we did. We left that consult. We Amazon primed us two speed lights to our house. That wedding was like three days after that. And so we we shipped them to my mom's house, and they come in the morning of the wedding, or the day before the wedding, the night before. And the next morning, Zoe and I are in my mom's driveway, taking pictures of each other with the flash being like yeah 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 like pulling a bounce card out of the flash being like this doesn't look terrible no this will work this will be fine say we got very lucky with that one because i happened to do like a tent reception it was a very small wedding it was in their like backyard and so they happened to do a tent like for the reception portion and so we were able to bounce the flash off of the white tent and it was just I don't even know that it was on purpose, but we were like, yeah, for some reason under the tent it works, and for some reason outside of the tent it doesn't work, so let's take all of our pictures under the tent and we'll be fine. That's practical problem solving right there. If you don't know how Bounce Flash works, go to the place where it looks good and keep photographing there. Yeah. Like, trial and error is an underrated way of learning, Like for me. like I really like the idea that you, you weren't afraid to tell the truth, you did potentially bend it a little bit in that particular case but you told the truth about your experience you charged a price appropriate for your experience level and you went and did the work because obviously like if you're saying that the wedding is three days out you don't have a lot of lead time there but i'm guessing there were other situations where there were techniques that you needed to learn or like equipment that you needed to master that you could genuinely gradually learn about and increase your skill level now I just want to give people a more rounded out view of you guys and where your business is now. Because at the moment, we're talking about 2019, which is not a long time ago. In my head, it's still 2019 because uh, coronavirus years just don't exist. Like It's like those years just got skipped. There was a lot of stress, a lot of crying, and that's, a, that's about all it was. So where are you now? See, so you started out with your $1,000 weddings, like in the full payment up front. What does your business look like now? What kind of market are you addressing? What kind of work is it for you? We're definitely still doing weddings. We pretty much, at that point, we were doing a little bit of everything and adding in weddings. But 
At this point, we pretty much only do weddings. I think for the reasons you specified at the beginning, this business really was important to our marriage and important to us spending time together. And I think that getting to be with people going through that situation together is just our favorite thing in the entire world, even over taking any pictures, honestly. I think at this point, because we're further in our marriage, we are starting to really appreciate family photography and just everyday type photography. And so I think that's something we've added in a little bit more. Um, but wedding photography. Yeah, for sure. And you know, now we don't do the thousand dollar weddings anymore. We we take a thousand dollar deposit whenever someone books their wedding. On average, our clients normally spend somewhere about six thousand dollars on their wedding collection. They're not all six thousand dollars, you know, sometimes they're four, sometimes they're nine, but on average about about six and currently we get about fifteen, sixteen weddings a year and working on getting that number up a little bit more. We've been really happy. We've shot 15 weddings a year, pretty much every single year since 2020. That's how we've done it. We've never shot more than 15 weddings in a year, and we've been able to double our income every single year doing this. And that alone is something that's worth exploring more because part of the reason I love photography as a job for myself was because it gives me more time to be with my family. Like I'm in a similar situation to you. Like I, I was employed as a photographer for a long time. I went freelance when my son was born because I wanted a longer paternity leave than I could get from my business that I was working for at the time. So I left and all the way through the pandemic, I had nearly infinite time with my family and it, it meant a lot. So when you say, oh, we've taken 15 weddings a year and we've managed to double our income without changing the number of weddings, I think that is, it's something that some people might find difficult to wrap the head around especially because the price point you're at is is still like for a uk audience that's a high price point like it, it's not uncommon for the, a very high paid photographer here to start at two and a half thousand pounds which is about sort of three thousand dollars and obviously seriously in a very short space of time especially by uk standards you're you've earned a very healthy amount of money you must be attracting clients that really value what you do and you've done it in a way that aligns with your personal life and your own physical, emotional, and, and wellness needs and your kind of philosophical needs that you want to support other people that might be building relationships just like yours that are foundational to who you are as people, bringing you closer together as a family unit. So I guess what I was hearing was that you're, you're both committed to making sure that this all works together. So you are a family documenting other people's families at the beginning expanding or just documenting them to make them more memorable further down the line and i guess like part of my, my kind of question is that obviously people will want that like i would want that if i was at the beginning of my career and i knew that there was a way of getting to where you are right now that wouldn't just be attractive that would be the goal for me work-life balance things that matter to me on an emotional spiritual or physical level and then a way of making the business sustainable and growing. But again, look, it, the process was made very simple there. You went through a pandemic and the, you have to have done something to create a body of work that people find attractive. So was there anything that you did to support this accelerated growth that you've had? Or was it purely a case of work the wedding, show the stuff, build a network? How did you get from the beginning stages to where you are now? I think that's a multi-folded question i don't think you can pinpoint like exactly one thing that we did i think one thing we always have done in this business and it's been a luxury that we've had since the beginning is we've always been able to find the odd job here the odd job there and kind of piece together our income over the last couple of years uh, neither one of us has ever had a full-time job outside of photography pretty much since we started but we've always Worked a little bit here, a little bit there to piece together some extra income so we weren't solely reliable on the photography. And we've never been afraid to invest back into the photography, whether that's to our clients or to education. From the very beginning, it was always giving even those people who paid us $1,000 a wedding the very best experience over like the fact that they only paid us $1,000 to photograph their weddings. It's funny now because we probably tried harder to book those weddings and maybe that's why we book so many of them. 
than we even do now. Now we do phone calls or Zoom calls for consults for all six or seven of those that we booked right there at the beginning. We were driving and meeting them, buying them dinner for them to pay us $1,000 to shoot their wedding because we knew that's what we needed to do to to pretty much to get them to book was we had to show them we were better people than any of the other photographers because we were better photographers than any of the other people. You know, I think that is one thing that did push us through is Nathan has this ability to be super confident about anything and everything. And I think partially he decides he can do something. He will make something happen. And so I just kind of like, I'm like, cool do your thing and I'll just but we like I said we always put the clients first in doing it there was probably some weddings at the beginning where by the end of it we were already starting to book by the time we were shooting those thousand dollar weddings in 2020 we were already booking thirty five hundred dollar weddings for the next year Um, and so we were just using that money to invest in the thousand dollar wedding people we didn't look at any wedding cliently any differently if that meant we were spending $200 on their wedding album and they only paid us $1,000 or we could take them out to dinner or we could do something extra for them, we were going to do it anyways. And then I think also education in our business was really, really important, especially for me for the very beginning. As always said, I have a tendency to, when I start something, I, I don't do things halfway and I will not do something if I don't think I can be the best at it. Like, it just won't interest me anymore. So unless I think there's an opportunity that I'm going to be the best at it, then I just don't do it. I think I learn primarily by doing. And so right before the pandemic hit, we found a stalled shoot and we decided to attend. And it actually, it ended up being like a gloomy day. We weren't great photographers to begin with. So the gloominess really set us back. But at the end of the day, it was better than what we had to show before. And so it opened us up to this like, oh, if I'm, if I'm giving the appropriate situation, I can do better. Because a lot of the times I think it really is important where you are and what's going on, at least it's more important in the beginning when you don't know how to work with the different factors. And we fell in love with that and we started to just take on any stealth shoot we possibly could and get that practice in, but also build our portfolio in that way. This is something that doesn't get talked about enough, but full stop. Skill can cover up bad circumstances to a degree, but if you want to make something really exceptional, you need both. And I think that there's this kind of belief that amazing photographers are purely amazing because of their talent. And that's definitely a factor. But I think there's a reason why, especially when you see a lot of high-end wedding professionals, there's an entire team listed. You've got amazing florists, you've got models, you've got dress designers, you've got locations and venues and planners. And essentially, if I was to try and produce something to the level that a wedding is produced at with the budgets involved, I'd be spending like hundreds of thousands of pounds to try and build these shoots out because genuinely that's what these couples are spending. And it's on a wedding day, which is absolutely fine. It's a once in a lifetime experience for many, many people. But I think it kind of gets forgotten that that is genuinely a factor. Like when you're a, a, a wedding professional, your job is to make sure that you get something beautiful regardless of the circumstances. But when you're looking at somebody else's work, don't forget that when they're tagging the florist and the dress designer, the reason they're doing that is because a huge part of what makes that shoot so successful is the input and talent of those people around you. And I think by the sounds of it, what you'd seen there was that when you're given a team that knows what they're doing, you can compete at the same level as a photographer that's at the top of the industry. And I think from an external perspective, looking at your work now, That's absolutely the case. You are both incredible photographers. You make emotive work with a visual identity, which is something that I harp on about a lot. But for anybody out there, if you're in the trenches and you're currently in a situation where you feel like you're not making the work that kind of measures up to everybody else, but you've never spoken to a planner, you've never dealt with a dress designer, or you don't have a hair or makeup artist, 
there's a good chance the reason why your work doesn't measure up visually is not solely because of your skill. It's because you need to grow your network and work with those people that are making these incredible subjects for you to photograph. Better florals means better flower pictures. But that said, the other side of it is like you said, once you've, once you'd had that experience, you use that as a kind of like an inspiration. So you attended the style shoot, you made these incredible images. What was next? What happened after that? With styled shoots, and I'm glad Zoe brought it up because I hadn't thought about it, but I definitely think that like styled shoots and those editorials are huge in where our business is at today. So we go to that first one and like Zoe said, we kind of become addicted to them. At this point, we've only shot very low budget weddings. We didn't even know anything like this existed prior to this point. And so we just start going to every single one we can find. I think it's important to note like, there are different tiers of um, style shoots too. And so at the beginning, when we say we we're going to every one of them, we, we really were, and we were doing low budget style shoots, but even a low budget style shoot for us was an improvement over what we were doing currently. And so it's like, you don't have to have loads of money to drop on a style shoot. Uh, as long as you can either put some things together, like with, with the vendors you do know, or are willing to invest a little bit of money, you can get yourself out there and start getting that practice. But of course, the more you're willing to invest into that, the more you will get. It started going up and up. And I mean, it was it was 2020. We found out we started doing styled shoots those few months. And then we just keep shooting them, keep doing them. And then July of 2020 comes around. And there's one at a really nice wedding venue here in Dallas called the White Sparrow. I, we sign up for it and I go and the lady running it is just the nicest and there's just something different about this style of shoot that we're at. Well, I'm at it. Zoe didn't even go with, to this one with me. So I'm there and I'm shooting it and there's just something different and those images from it were just magical and they were the best pictures I'd ever taken in my whole life and I had so much fun and I leave it and I, t I go home and I tell Zoe and I'm like, Zoe, this, this lady running this style of shoot, she was, she was the best. I just feel like we could be really good friends with her. And so we keep going on and it's another, which is funny because we've never said never, I've never told her this to her face, but the next year she's doing some styled shoots in the Seattle P and W area, a set of them. And me and Zoe spend the money and we take our little vacation and we go to these shoots and we show up to the first one and this is the first time Zoe and her have ever met and her husband and her daughter that happens to be the same age as Beckham are there and it was like instantaneously meeting a group of people that Zoe and I had known our entire lives and we instantaneously like on that trip became best friends and We've been best friends ever since then, and she puts on editorials all over the world, and we get drug all over the world with her to go do them now. But at the time, I think we were her like highest paying clients because everything she put out there, we were like, we have to. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> just constantly just doing them over and over and spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And we make fun of her now. It's become Taylor's. Taylor is the person's name it's become zoe's one of zoe's best friends and one of my best friends and it's funny because we make fun of her because it's like dude you screwed yourself because we were giving you bukus of money and now like you don't make us pay you just make us come help you put these things together yeah but i think those styled shoots really were they helped us develop that style i don't think if you look at our images honestly like a lot of that visual identity that you see i think it's because of her because we photograph her work so often and like you said with a lot of luxury photographers and high-end wedding professionals if you look at their work too you'll see they work with a lot of the same dress designers they work with a lot of the same planners they work with a lot of the same florists and it's because of that same reason it's not just about having people that are really good at their jobs it's about having a group of people who are going for the same visual identity and the same thing that you want to be able to do this together and that's the other half of the equation. Basically, this isn't a business if you're only indulging your own your own eye. The entire point of having a visual identity for a business is like, right, who are we appealing to? 
how do we make our brand values communicated by the way these images look and, and vice versa. So when you're saying that, you're essentially putting together a package, you're producing a catalog that allows a, a bride or a groom or whomever to look through the magazine and say, oh, wow, this venue looks incredible with these florals. Like, I wonder who did the photography and it's you. And then the next is, like, oh, wow, this dress looks incredible. That gown's amazing. I wonder who did the photography and it's you. It's like an alignment process. You've essentially put yourself in the same room, in the same conversation with people that care about the things that you care about and are trying to appeal to a person that has a very specific taste. I did want to switch gears a little bit in a second because weirdly, I actually think that the two of you take a very artist first approach to the way you produce your images, but you always put yourself in a context where the value of the photograph is wider than just your own input. It's not just about the two of you. For anybody that doesn't know already, Nathan and Zoe have their own po podcast, the Who Cares podcast. I was a guest on that a few weeks ago, a few months ago. It's been a while. It was a while ago. So have a look back if you want to listen to that one. But in a recent episode, you ended up talking a little bit about your approach. And I'd like to understand a little bit more how you see each wedding. You said in your own podcast that you weren't afraid of taking risks if it gave you the result that you wanted. So can you talk a little bit about your approach, how you see a wedding day? Because like you said, everything you do in terms of your branding is about serving a couple. It's about making somebody else's work shine. How do you get your own creative fulfillment out of the work that you do? I, I think it's changed and it's changed so quickly because we haven't been doing this a long, long time. And so, um, for one, I think always be willing, being willing to experiment. And then I think for two, we've always found other photographers work that we've really enjoyed. And then being the research heavy person that I am, I will look into anything and everything that's going to give us that look that we want to have. I think that one of the biggest things for us, and I think we just got lucky on this, is that there's two of us and we both are very passionate about it. And so anytime that we want to try something new, we have a, a backup to fall on, right? So it's like, I want to try this crazy thing. Make sure you get just the basic coverage just in case because we don't know. Doing a lot of style shoots and doing a lot of work outside of like paid work it really helps because you get to be as creative as you want to and you don't have that pressure. And then the more that you practice that, practice being creative and practice trying different things, the more you realize like, okay, this works. I enjoy this. And you're able to show your clients that. And then you realize they also like that. And so you can kind of continue there. I think if you keep doing the same thing forever, it kind of starts to get boring. So learning and trying different things is it's just part of it for us i don't want to be bored even from the day we first started doing this even though we were trying to make it a job so we could spend more time together i didn't want to be a wedding photographer i wanted to be the best wedding photographer i was going to keep looking into and trying to figure out and everything i could to be the best wedding photographer that's the goal is to be the best wedding photographer we've taken courses and to work on it from the beginning and, and tried to learn and then you don't know what you don't know so then you find more groups and I found more people that shoot similar styles to what like we were drawn to and leaned more to that and then kind of found that like I like this and I don't like this and figured it out I think at the beginning of people's career people are always like it's not about the gear it's not about it's not about the gear and I think it's important for beginners to note that because you can create gorgeous pictures with any camera on the market today, but your gear can help influence your visual identity that you have in your own work. There's a reason all the fine art film photographers for the longest time use the Contact 645 and the 80 because it gave a very particular look. So gear does matter in figuring that out but you have to know why you're using something and then you have to follow what you like the question was how do you balance your own creativity as well as your clients needs and i think it's really every single time 
putting your client's needs above anything else um, and understanding who your client is. And I think that we're very fortunate because I am absolutely in love with all of our clients and we get to build these really great relationships with them. The creativity, I feel like, is always there, but the creativity looks different per client because um, some of them are more outgoing and some of them want to be wild and run around and do crazy things and some of them are a little more reserved. I think understanding your client and understanding um, how to create work that they will love is still should always be your top priority because it's more than just taking a picture. It's something they're going to have forever. Beyond anything, our goal is always to create work that shows them off and who they are. And people are so unique and amazing and just their their own person and getting to be there and experience such an amazing moment and just like full day of different emotions is insane and it's such a privilege. And so I think the time that you're not prioritizing your client and just who they are as a person, you're really going to be held back creatively because if they're not feeling their best self and they're not absolutely comfortable being who they are, then you're not going to be able to create amazing things. You're going to get stuck. While you were talking about the needs of your client and understanding what they want out of a moment, what makes it beautiful for them, it reminded me how many of the rules that we follow as photographers were set by other older photographers. Simple things like sharpness. Like you mentioned before, for people that don't know, that you're using a medium format camera with a manual focus lens as like the one that you love the most. And limited depth of field, it's hard to get it in focus perfectly. So if you were looking at the photographer's idea of what a good photograph is, it would be both eyes in focus, the background blur should still show the context, and you shouldn't have any kind of motion blur in the image, everything should be still and static. But that's a photographer's idea of what that should look like, whereas it might be that really what this couple wanted was their first kiss to be captured in a way where the attention wasn't fully on them. You could still see the essence of the moment but it wasn't about their eyes being open or in focus. It was about them remembering it and having a kind of more fuzzy relationship with the photograph because it wasn't a clear memory for them because it was a whirlwind. Or it could be that really they wanted some space, so you want it to be detached, so you might step back and get a more expansive view. But the fact is that you don't really know what your client's expectations are unless you show them how you handle these moments and say, is this what you want? And I think that's one of those times where style sheets make a lot of sense for wedding professionals because it's not like me. If I want to make images I've never made before, I go find somebody doing that thing and we take pictures because I could do it again. Whereas for you guys, it's a little bit different in the sense that if somebody's getting married, there's one go around for that wedding. It's never happening again. And you can't say to somebody like, I'm going to do it differently on your wedding day as an experiment if you don't also cover the base the way that the default would be. And just because it's the default for a photographer doesn't even necessarily mean it's going to please your client. So part of the reason why I think, especially the beginning, experimenting outside of risky situations makes sense is not for portfolio. It's not to be like, oh, look at how great I am, I arranged this. Because like you said, that those are shoots that have been arranged by somebody else with somebody else's skill involved. But it shows you, given ideal circumstances, how do I believe this emotion should be communicated? How do I believe this subject is best conveyed? And then you can show somebody and say like, cool, it's like this, look here, see how we handle the first kiss. Given those circumstances, here is what you would get. Do you agree? This is the most beautiful way of dealing with it. And what you were saying, Nathan, it sounds like you've got both elements of this. So Nathan's like pushing what's next. And Zoe's like, cool, how does this fit for the couple? So you've got this kind of wonderful you've got this kind of wonderful growth possibility in that you can work together that Nathan can go after it and try and tie down the thing that is the next big thing and so he can measure that up against well what do our couples really want so like you said you might love using the X100V from Fujifilm but if the files don't look the way that your couples appreciate it then it's not the right tool for you and you need to find something else which is super cool 
So with all this said, I just wanted to thank you both for sparing the time, first of all, because we've been running for, for nearly an hour now and you, you've, you've just been super helpful. Thank you for being vulnerable with me and sharing the reason why you got into this and what drives you to document people's love stories and, and families. But moreover, thanks for reminding me that it's possible to have standards other than your own. The people that you work for can care about the same things as you. And as long as you're showing them what they're going to get, you can take immense risks and do things in a really creative and interesting way. So thank you. Thank you for having us. So, yeah, this was so fun. It's always, I feel like talking to you every single time, we always realize things about our own work that we didn't know. And we always end up having, I feel like some of my favorite conversations after we talk to you. So really, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, you're always always a pleasure to talk to you too. Like if anybody wants to listen back, uh, Nathan and Zoe have been the guest on the Roundtable of the podcast a few times. Again, I'll stick some links in the show notes and a link to their podcast, the Who Cares podcast, because it's definitely worth listening to. If you're ever in the mood for just having some company while you edit, highly, highly recommend it. A nice audio-only podcast with plenty to listen to. But that said, guys, thanks again for listening in. I'll see everybody next week. And yeah. Goodbye.